Our world is on edge as Russia launches a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. This is following months of threatening moves. Ukrainians and other people across the region are now living in absolute fear amid growing questions about the country's future. For more on this, let's bring in Peter Rowe. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and he joins us now. Uh, Peter, thanks for joining us. So, so is Ukraine, it's one of the things you probably heard us talking with our correspondent, Charlie Dagata, who's on the ground in Ukraine. We asked him specifically how Ukraine is prepared to defend itself right now. We know, obviously, that NATO countries in the United States have sent in weapons uh, and resources to Ukraine, but they don't have air defense systems, which are important if you're going to at least control the skies. They're not able to do that right now. So how will Ukrainians defend themselves? I'm sorry to say it is a bit of an unfair fight. Uh, the Russians underwent a major military reorganization over the last several years, moving their command from division to brigade levels. And they have these battalion tactical groups that are much discussed as part of this reorganization, giving them more flexibility. They've also invested a great deal in the military modernization over the past decade. They spend over 4% of GDP on defense. So it is a bit of an unfair or unequal fight. The Ukrainians have vastly improved their military forces since the 2014 campaign began. That's, of course, when Vladimir Putin first moved into Ukraine and annexed Crimea. So they have improved. The Ukrainians I've met with over the years have a certain plucky nationalism. They intend to stand and fight, and they intend to resist Vladimir Putin. But uh, the sheer correlation of forces on the ground makes it very difficult for the Ukrainians to stand up to the Russians. And this opening phase of the campaign clearly is aimed at suppressing a lot of those assets that Ukraine may have, which can threaten Russian air superiority. Peter, can we talk about the strategy when it has when it's come to sanctions? Obviously, the initial round of sanctions didn't re really make much of a difference at all. And they were really, really focused and, and targeted some banks, some oligarchs who were still incredibly wealthy mm -hmm. anyways. But even the sanctions that we seem to be talking about now, it occurred to me that it doesn't seem like they would have an immediate crippling effect. They're going to take a a while to actually have an impact on the Russian economy. And in the meantime, Ukraine is being attacked. Oh, the Rupal is down today. Uh, it's getting crushed. In the but that's different. Yeah. That's different than, you know, we talk about they won't have access to, to you know, microchips. They probably got a warehouse of microchips. Mm. Like, it's going to mm. take a while before that makes a difference, mm. you know. So I want to ask you, Peter, in terms of how to use sanctions against someone like Vladimir Putin so it really makes a difference, what do you say? I think the fate of Ukraine was sealed the moment President Biden in that press goggle proclaimed that he would not be deploying U.S. ground troops into Ukraine. Once we switch to the track of using economic sanctions in a military conflict, we're really bringing essentially a celery stick to a knife fight, to use a metaphor, and uh, the inevitable ended up taking place. Now the U.S. does have extraordinary assets, in particular the dollar dominance of the international system means that it can cut Russia effectively out of financial system. It can really cripple uh, some of the overseas oligarch holdings. These are all measures where really it's a matter of political will. In the past, uh, the U.S. and Europe has not been prepared to go the extra step to really take on the Russians. And I think uh, the strategy to date has sort of reflected that. It's as if we've thought that economic sanctions could deter Russia, hence the Democrats turning down the Republicans on Capitol Hill who wanted to punish uh, Vladimir Putin ahead of this invasion. And we've sought not to provoke the Russians, which is, I think, partially why uh, the administration apparently pulled back Senator Menendez when he's pushing for a, a preemptive sanctions negotiation with the uh, Republicans in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. It also explains why for several weeks military aid sat on the desk of the president before it was actually signed. That worldview, I think, was shattered overnight with the Russian intervention. And so once we, I think, take the mindset that we are in a persistent conflict with the Russians, which is how Vladimir Putin views his relationship with the West, mm. I think we'll be able to make much more progress on some of those technical questions which you asked. Because the U.S. still is the most powerful country in the world. And when we have our will matched to those resources, uh, a lot is possible, in particular if our allies join us. So, Peter, earlier today, you tweeted that no one should be shocked at Russia behaving in a, quote, 19th century fashion. And that got me thinking, because I know in speeches and from the reports uh, from people who have covered Russia for a long time, that Vladimir Putin envisions himself the type of leader like Peter the Great. But it, my, in my mind, when I read your tweet, I thought of another leader, Tsar Nicholas II. And the reason I thought of that is because although Russia is this massive country, it has millions of people, and the military is enormous, and they can send that military into countries like Ukraine, there is a limit to what the Russian people will stand. These sanctions... Mm that we're talking about. Okay, let's say they don't have immediate effect, but in the long term, 
the poverty that comes from that, the debilitating economic crisis that most Russians will face themselves in, there may be another antecedent there, which is we all know how it ended up for the czar. Right, or Catherine the Great. Peter the Great, perhaps known as somewhat of a reformer, might not be the best analogy for Vladimir Putin, but I take your point. Um, I think in that tweet, what I meant to express is that we often say in sort of a solipsistic fashion that someone's behaving like a 19th century actor. When truth be told, these are tools that people use in the 21st century uh, just the same. It's just that we can't imagine them in the West, and as a result, we come up short in the way that we uh, go at the Russians or the way that we kind of predict their calculations. Maybe one analogy from the near near past, I've met with a lot of continental Europeans who are shocked that the British ended up voting for Brexit because they say it's not in the British material interest. But sometimes people take decisions that aren't in their material interest because they have other values that supersede uh, maybe dollars and cents uh, uh, decisions. But uh, in the case of, of Russia, you know, you're right. Um, at, over time, this certainly will have a major impact on the Russian economy. But you know, Putin has cards to play as well. He's not just going to stand in a defensive crouch and take these sanctions. He can launch cyber attacks. Think back to the Colonial Pipeline attacks last fall, or a major meat manufacturer packaging uh, organization that he took on. He could try to cut undersea cables, which really would be something of a nuclear step. But if he thinks that we're trying to destroy the Russian economy, uh, he will use that, which he thinks he has parity in, military affairs or the military domain to make his point in the economic competition. So we as the West have to steal ourselves. We have to be prepared to bear the costs. The markets are down already today. Energy prices are bound to go up and really uh, uh, engage in this competition because the Russians really only respect strength and it's the only way to check him in the end. So, Peter, real quick then, um, to your point about the, you know, the deed was done once Putin realized that the United States was not willing to engage in actual combat with them. So, you know who else is watching this? China. And our response and the West's response to what happens in Ukraine will be certainly something that they'll be talking about in the Chinese Communist Party when it comes, for example, to Taiwan. So if, if, if an action like this is not full out war and no one is advocating that, then it means essentially that any dictator, any country can do what they want because they know that the worst that they can face are sanctions. All of these issues are connected. I mean, the Afghan withdrawal, the way that unfolded, I think probably made an impression in Moscow. I'd offer one more negotiation that's ongoing where the US and Russia are ostensibly on the same side, and that's the Iran nuclear talks in Vienna. The Russians have watched as the Iranians have bullied the Americans. They've used force in the Middle East, and the US has moved off of its red lines in those nuclear talks. So Putin might conclude, if the Iranians can do that, why can't I? If the Chinese can take Hong Kong without much of a cost or price to pay, why can't I have my turn in Europe? And the Chinese surely will be watching this uh, uh, to try to gauge American resolve and Western resolve when it comes to Taiwan, which is of crucial importance owing to the semiconductor industry, the fact that we have an obligation to them, and really to defend our allies in Asia Pacific in the first island chain. So there's a, a tremendous amount at stake. Today, one could say, is the funeral of the post-Cold War order. We're entering into a new age of real competition, extreme competition with our adversaries. And I uh, wish the president all the best, and um, we'll be doing what we can to develop policy options to help support the administration in that. Peter Rowe, thank you very much. Thanks.